Well, I want to welcome all of you to Cross Community Church, and as I begin this morning, I want to say thank you to everyone who came and served and worked. Y'all, when we do a work day, it's not like just kind of a little of this and a little of that, nothing too heavy. Like, we worked hard yesterday. There were men and women and kids that that served for five or six hours yesterday. Uh, We cut trees, we hauled brush. I mean, it it was quite a day. And so to all of you who uh, helped and worked and served in that regard, I just want to say thank you. This is a body of Christ, and each of us serves the other. Uh, We don't have a janitor here. We don't, like, pay people to clean the building. Like, people come in every week. They serve. They offer their time, their gifts, their abilities uh, in the same way that people teach or preach or, or play music. Like, this is a body that we serve one another. And there was a group of people, about 100 people between both campuses that served really well, and I just want to again say thank you for that. Uh, The second thing this morning, uh, this is bad news, but it's truth. This is our last day in the book of Philippians. As we've preached through this over the last several months, this is the final sermon. This is where Paul kind of pulls it all together. He closes everything out. He's summing up his his final thoughts in the letter, And, and one, one of the things I would want you to see as you look through uh, any of the letters, any of the uh, epistles that Paul wrote to the churches, uh, it wasn't like individual thoughts. We get them in snippets, right? You get a sermon one week and then a sermon another week, and uh, it doesn't necessarily always pull together all that well. But Paul wrote this letter. He sat down. They would have read it in, in one setting, maybe with their church. They would have gathered and read it aloud. And so as much as you would hear individual sermons in this book, I would want you to hear it as a whole. And what we're going to talk about today, uh, I believe wholeheartedly builds upon what we talked about last week. Now, if you weren't here, I want to remind you that last week we talked about a rare commodity uh, for the American church, and that is contentment. It is not something we find very often, not in all of our culture. As a matter of fact, we live in a society that's rather consumeristic, right? There's always someone trying to sell you something. It may be uh, companies online because, you know, you like Google something and the next thing you know, you see ads for it everywhere you look through your internet browsing and social media. Like, they're always trying to sell you something. It might be that you walk into a store and you see displays that make you think you need the, at this point, it's the Reese's Easter eggs, right? You're like, oh, I do need those. They happen to be at the front of the store. I should get a few packages. Um, And it might be your sister-in-law who's now in a a pyramid scheme, multi-level marketing, and they're trying to sell you something. Now, for us to live as disciples in America, it's going to feel a bit counter-cultural. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you want to be my disciple, you, you take up your cross and you begin to follow me. Last week we saw that God, Jesus Christ, has provided contentment for us. It's not in the new stuff, the new house, the new car, the new circumstances, or the new relationship, but rather it is in Jesus Christ, in Him alone, that our our hearts can be fully satisfied and finally content in Him. You and I were made to live in a relationship with with our Creator, And nothing in all of creation will ever satisfy that. It is God alone who is our provider. He is our protector. He is our comforter. He is our peace. He alone satisfies our souls. When we enjoy a right relationship with God, when we walk in a right relationship with Him, then and only then can we enjoy a right relationship with His creation. You want to know what true marriage is, a true biblical marriage, what that should look like. Enjoy that with your spouse. First, your heart needs to be satisfied in Jesus Christ. You want to know how to handle your money and your finances and interact with stuff in this world? First, your your heart has to be satisfied in Jesus Christ. The, The things of creation, they're not our security. They're not our comfort. They're not our hope. They're not our pleasure. That's found in Jesus Christ alone. Now, Paul, in concluding his letter to the Philippians, is actually going to commend them for something. We saw this at the end of last week in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. He said, Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. And we're going to pick up this week in verse 15. I want to read just a few verses here to you. 
So they've been giving to him, to Paul. They've been helping him, supporting him in his ministry. In verse 15, he points out that this wasn't a one-time event, that this was a regular occurrence. He says, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, that was the region where Philippi was. He's like, when I left there, uh, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. He's like, remember, when I, when I left you, like you were the only church that would support me in my missionary endeavors and on my journey. Paul, when he would go to place to place to place, he would make tents just to support himself, selling those wherever he might be. But the Philippian church, among all the others, was the only one that helped support him on these journeys. So we know that they gave to Paul when he left Philippi, the region of Macedonia, But he goes on, he says, For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. So there's at least two more gifts there uh, when Paul was in Thessalonica preaching the gospel that they'd sent to provide for Paul on his missionary journeys. He continues on, he says, Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus, that was the man sent from Philippi to Paul who was in Rome, He says, I've received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So on at least four different occasions, the believers in the city of Philippi, even though they might have been suffering persecution, even though they might have been being beaten with rods as Paul was while he was there for the sake of the gospel, they were still sending money to support the, 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 the spread of the gospel through the apostle Paul. They kept helping him. They kept supplying and meeting his needs. Now, there are some things that we can glean from this. You look in this text, there's not a single command anywhere in this. As a matter of fact, Paul commends them. He said, hey, listen, this is not about my need. This is not about like, uh, hey, I got to have some money, so I'm going to write you a letter and try to persuade you. And I want to say on the front end today that what I'm not going to do here is try to persuade you to give a bunch of money. Not for the sake of need in our church. And not for the sake of, of, of people who may otherwise like be destitute in some way. But today I am going to try to convince you to begin to give sacrificially. And first and foremost, I want you to do it for your own benefit. A lot of people get angry when you talk about money and giving in the church. And it very well may be true that there are some churches that only care about your money. I don't think that was the intent of Paul here. And I want you to know it's not my intent to get your money. He says with clarity in verse 17, not that I seek the gift itself. But instead, he says, I seek for the profit, which is going to be increasing to your account. The first thing I want you to see about giving sacrificially, as we begin to dive into God's word today, is that God blesses your giving. Again, he says in verse 17, not that I seek the gift itself. He's like, this is not about me. It's not about me having a bunch of money. Remember last week, Paul's like, I've learned the secret of having a bunch, and I've learned the secret of being in poverty. I know what that is. I'm going to be satisfied. I'm going to be content in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so he repeats again, this is not about me. This is not about enriching myself. And I want to say to you today, this is not about cross-community church. God has been good to us. But instead, I would argue this is about you. And Paul says, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. The first point here today on why you should give sacrificially is that God blesses giving. Now, if you're like me and you can balance a checkbook or you like to do math a little bit, uh, when you think about giving, uh, this may seem counterintuitive to you. I mean, when you think about giving, if you have $1,000 and you give 100 away, we got $900 left, right? That's the way that this works. It happens in, in every scenario. Like you subtract money from an account, it's lessen, not increase. And yet Paul would say, listen, with regard to your giving. I seek for the profit which increases your account. 
I want you to know that in the kingdom of God, and this is why this is so important for us, in the kingdom of God, uh, when we give, we get. It is, it is God who blesses our giving. Do you remember the story that's in all four of the Gospels? The, the one story that's recorded, that, that happened, all four of the gospel writers, they, they wanted to get this down. It's really important that you understood this one. It, it actually starts with a little boy who must have been at home with his mom, and he's like, hey, she's not a helicopter mom, by the way. He's like, hey, I'm going to go out and listen to Jesus somewhere out in the open country. I'm going to go out in the wilderness. It's going to be distant from here. And she's like, well, um, here's a little meal. She was a caring mom. Um, and so she sends him with uh, five pieces of bread, and two small fish. This would have been a meager meal for a small child. The young man goes out and he begins to listen to Jesus as he's preaching uh, in the open country and large crowds gathered. The, the scriptures tell us there were 5,000 men in addition to women and children. This is a huge crowd. It gets a little bit late. The disciples got a little hungry. They say, Jesus, hey, why don't you send the crowds home? We're, we're a long way off, and um, we don't have enough food, and there's really nowhere to buy food here. And Jesus turns to his disciples. He says, well, give them something to eat. And so they, they started looking around, like, what, what do we have here? And as they, they looked around the crowd, they found only that small boy who had only five loaves, barley loaves. These were not like Wonder Bread, right? These are small loaves. This was, again, a meager meal for a small child. And they're like, well, here's what we have, the five loaves and two fish, Jesus. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, which were just enough for that small boy, and he blessed him. Go and hand these out. The disciples began to distribute the bread and the fish. All four of the gospel writers tell us that 5,000 men, in addition to their wives and their children, Ate on that day until they were full. And then afterward, they picked up 12 baskets full of the leftovers. Little boy who only had five small loaves and two small fish eats until he's full. And then there are leftovers. What I would want you to know about giving is that God blesses giving. And God's economy is not like ours. He's not limited in the sense that we are. Like for many of us, we think, I can't afford to give. Like I can't afford to do that sort of thing. I can't let go of my money because I have to take care of my needs. What I want you to know is that when you entrust what God has already entrusted to you, when you will send that into his kingdom, when you will begin to give to help and to serve other people. I mean, think about this little boy. It's all he had to eat for the day. He was a young man. It's what his mom had given him to eat on. And yet he was willing to place that in the hands of God, and God did the miraculous with it. The first reason why I would encourage you to begin giving sacrificially is that God blesses giving. He takes what you and I give. L listen, God doesn't need our money, right? He spoke the world into existence. He could create on a whim. He doesn't need our money, but he wants our hearts. And when we entrust what he's given us back to him, when we sow it into the kingdom of God, God blesses that. We get to become participants in the miraculous work of God, both here and around the world. One of the things that Paul includes here at the end of this text is a really stunning detail to the church that had given money to support him when he left Philippi while he was in Thessalonica and now had supported him while he was in Rome. I want you to hear how he concludes the letter. In verse uh, 19, he says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint, in Christ, saints, every saint in Christ Jesus, and the brethren who are with, you, with me greet you as well. And then he, he includes this little detail that I want you to hear. This detail that would have like given the people chills, if you, it, it, it would us too if we understood just how powerful this was. He says, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Did you hear that little detail he just included there? Do you remember back at the beginning of 
Paul's letter to the Philippians. He was rejoicing that he found himself in a Roman prison. He's like, as a result of my imprisonment, the whole Praetorian Guard has begun hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who live and guard in the palace, they're hearing the gospel. And you know what had happened as a result of Paul proclaiming the gospel while he was in prison in Rome? Members of Caesar's household had come to faith. And Paul's like, hey, those people wanted me to greet you because they know that you've been supporting the work that's happening here. Like it wasn't Paul sitting in a prison in Rome who gets all the credit and all the glory for those people who came to faith. It was the Philippian believers who said, you know what, I'm not going to live my life all about me. And I'm not going to keep everything that I had myself. Instead, I'm going to invest it in the kingdom of God. And it's literally the highest levels of rulers in the world in Caesar's household. They come to faith in the gospel. Now, had Paul not told them, they would have no idea that as a result of their support, while Paul was in chains in a prison in Rome, that the gospel had infiltrated the household of Caesar. And that men and women at the highest levels of society had come to faith in Jesus Christ. What I want you to know, and I want to be really clear about this, The fact that you sow a dollar or ten dollars into God's kingdom doesn't mean you're going to get a hundred dollars in return. I'm not telling you you're going to get rich. Any preacher who does is lying to you. Your giving to the kingdom of God may be costly to you. You may have to tell yourself no. You may struggle at times. Your kids may not get to have what everyone else gets to have. But God will take your gift, and he will bless it, and he will use it to do his work in our city, and in our school system, in our state, in our country, and around the world. And he will do the miraculous. You will get to be a participant in gospel works that you may never know about, where a huge harvest may be reaped, even if you don't see it. So today... As followers of Jesus Christ, who call yourselves disciples, who said, Jesus is my Lord, I want to encourage you to begin giving sacrificially because God blesses giving. I got a phone call uh, last week, and during our snowstorm, uh, where everyone's pipes froze, kind of a miserable time for many of us. Uh, people were without electricity and water. We got a phone call here at the church, and this happens all the time. Uh, where people call and they have a need. And so a local organization said, hey, uh, we've got people that were in town for dialysis and they can't get back home and they don't have anywhere to stay. Could you help them with a hotel room? And I'm like, sure. There were four of them. We don't know their names to this day. Sure, we'll put them up in a hotel. We went and paid for their room for the night. They could continue their treatment the next day. One of our community groups who had asked, hey, how can we help people in this time? They went and they um, gathered up like care packages for them, blessed them with food and some things that they might need since they weren't able to get back home like they'd intended. The phone call I got last week uh, was uh, another pastor in the area. He's like, man, I can't tell you how thankful I am for Cross Community Church. He's like, what you didn't know is that one of those men, and I still don't know his name, But one of those men who you put up like in a hotel room, uh, he was a struggling pastor in a church in a a town that's nearby. And he's been working for years upon years upon years, working another job and trying to support himself while he preaches and ministers to this congregation. He's found himself ill. He didn't have the money and he didn't know what he was going to do. And your church was there for him. Like he couldn't be more thankful that your church would invest in him. Oh, that's a privilege We got to be a part of that. And he goes back and he preaches Jesus Christ to people that we may never know or meet. And the gospel goes forward. We got to be a tiny part of what God was doing there. And to be honest with you, it didn't cost us that much. That's a privilege. God blesses our giving. Again, this isn't a promise of financial profit every time. But I can promise you that God's going to take care of you. The second thing that I want you to know, the second reason why I think you should give sacrificially, why as your pastor I would tell you to start doing it today, 
The first is that God blesses giving. The second is that giving blesses God. Look in verse 18. Paul writing about the gifts that they sent. He says, I have received everything in full and I have an abundance. I am amply supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. Then he describes what that gift is to God. He says it's a fragrant aroma. An acceptable sacrifice. It is well pleasing to God. God blesses giving, but our giving also blesses God. If you remember the heart of God toward us, it was one of sacrificial giving. Every one of us in this room, whether we're willing to acknowledge it or not, owed a debt of sin. The wage for that was death. You and I owed a debt that we couldn't pay separated from God for an eternity. And God looked at us, dead in trespasses and sins. You know what he did? His response in love, he gave his one and only son. Jesus Christ came to earth. He lived a sinless life. He was rejected. He was abandoned. He was mocked. He was beaten. Placed a crown of thorns on his head. Nails driven through his wrists and his ankles. Spear thrust through his side. God did that for us. We are the recipients of sacrificial giving beyond anything we would ever give. God has given richly to us. And when we give to other people, it blesses the heart of God. It's a fragrant aroma. It's an acceptable sacrifice. It's well-pleasing to God. In John chapter 12, verse 5, um, we, we see a scene. It's Mary and Martha, the two sisters, um, there with Jesus. He's, he's visiting with Lazarus, and Mary comes with some perfume. It was worth about a year's worth of wages, pretty costly stuff. As Jesus is there, she anoints his feet. The smell fills the whole room. Judas, who was there, was kind of upset about it. Why would you do this to God? Like, why would you do this? Why would you waste this? We could have sold that jar of perfume and fed hundreds of people. Jesus is like, no, no, no. Let her do it. And you're going to have the poor with you forever. There will be a lot of time to care for them. But right now, man, she's blessing her Savior. What she's doing is not offered to other people. It's not about how far the money goes. It's not about getting the most bang for a buck. It's about offering what she has to the Lord that she loves. For many of us, we get really caught up in making sure that people are going to spend our money in a manner that's consistent with what we think is best. And we're, I'm not going to give to those people because they spend too much on this or on that. Giving, first and foremost, is a matter of worship to a God who's given richly to us. And so today, as I encourage you to give sacrificially, I want you to remember that God blesses your giving. And He takes it, and He uses it, He stewards it, He's the one that does the work. But also that your giving blesses God. He's honored and he's worshipped when you take away from what he's given to you or when you choose not to indulge at all in you and your family, but you help other people. And it blesses the heart of God. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, both of my kids were in elementary school at the time. And uh, they would get milkshake money. They would remember it on the school way to school every day. And so they would scrounge through the quarters that I had in my console or, hey, Dad, do you have a dollar that I can have? I want to get a milkshake at school today. And so that was like every day this would happen. And so uh, there were a couple of them. And, I mean, it got kind of expensive, you know, day in and day out. We're buying a lot of milkshakes. And so I would ask him, like, how was milkshake today? And one day uh, my oldest son, well, how was the milkshake today? I didn't get one. 
Like, are you kidding me? Are you like the kind of person that, that if someone says, hey, does anyone want a piece of gum? And you're like, yeah. And then you put the gum in your pocket and keep it for later. It's like, who does that? Right? I thought he was hoarding the money that I was giving him. I was kind of upset. Like, what are you doing? He's like, no, there, there's this kid that he never gets to get a milkshake. And so I gave him a dollar so he could have milkshake. I was like, yes. Like, he's getting it. You know, like, oh my gosh, I'm not a total failure as a father. Like, he's learning. Like, that, that this is like you can care about other people. And you know what I did? I gave him $2 the next day. God is the same toward us. And he's a gracious father. And he cares for us. He has given sacrificially to us. And we have an opportunity to give sacrificially to others. We are the richest nation ever to live like in the history of the whole world no one has had more disposable income than we do and we can continue to run the the rat race we can continue to spin our wheels buying thing after thing after thing consuming the next possession the next fad the next thing or we can find contentment in christ jesus where we don't have to keep up with everybody else we can find contentment with what we have and we can begin to sow that money into the kingdom of God. We can offer it to God who's offered his son Jesus to us as worship. And we can know that God takes what we give and he blesses it. But there's one more thing I want you to know about your giving. God blesses giving and giving blesses God. But the final thing that I want you to see here from Philippians chapter 4 is that God supplies the giver. Many people, maybe even most, never learn who God truly is with regard to their finances. Spend their whole life like coming to church every week, reading the word, praying, but they never come to know God as their provider. Like, he is going to take care of you. Look what Paul says here in verse 19. He says, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. The God who spoke the sun, moon, and the stars into existence, created every bird, every tree, I like all of it. God spoke it into existence. Paul's like, to the giver, to the person who's willing to trust him, and God is going to supply you. And he ain't broke. Right? God, who has riches beyond what we can fathom, wants to take care of you. And so there's a couple of options here in this. We can trust in our money. We can trust in our 401k, our savings account, our own security, our own comfort, our own provision. Or we can trust in God. Can I just tell you, sometimes I get a little bit frustrated at how unconcerned my kids are at what it costs to feed them and to do all the things that they want to do. You know, they are completely unconcerned about it. They don't care at all. They're like, hey, Dad, let's go on vacation every week. Like, Dad, let's just do all these things. Like, they have nothing but ideas out there because they know that no matter what, their dad is going to take care of them. What would you dream about doing? If you knew that God was going to take care of you, like who would you want to help if you knew that no matter what, God was going to make sure your needs were met? Like God was going to make sure that your family was taken care of. That far better than, uh, you know, a few dollars in a bank account or the security of a home can provide that God was going to keep you safe. That he was going to care for you. That he would be your security. That he would be your comfort. That he would be your provider. Like, what would you want to do if you just looked at your money and said, okay, what could we do with this? Who could we help? Who could we serve if you trusted that God would supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. What good would you do? What thing is there? I mean, my kids, their imaginations are limitless. Luke wants a Ferrari for his first car. He's, he's pretty excited about that. Or a Lambo, throw that in. He's, he's big on that. I mean, the, the, their, their desires are like unending. And they think 
Dad's made of money, right? God made money. God made everything you've ever known and seen. God has given to you every dollar that's ever come through your fingers or your bank account. And the scriptures tell us that God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. God blesses giving, and giving blesses God. And no matter what, God supplies the giver. There's this interesting thing that takes place in the scriptures where, you know, people are always looking for contradictions in the Bible. Like, well, God said this, but then he said it this way. And I don't think any of them are very valid. Like, I think they're generally just cheap shots at the scriptures. But there is one place in the Bible that I know of that it gets a little bit iffy, right? So Deuteronomy chapter 6, literally verse 16 says, Do not put the Lord to the test. But there's one exception. If you read the prophet Malachi, the end of the Old Testament, talking to the people of God, and God speaking through him, God said, except this once. There's one place in your life that you're allowed to put God to the test. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. God said, you can test me on this one. He was speaking about the Old Testament law where it talked about bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse. That was a tenth of everything that people would earn or their increase, their, you know, their harvest. They bring a tenth in, and that was how they fed the priest and the Levites back then and cared for the temple. Listen, that's not valid today. Like, we don't exercise the tithe. Y'all don't bring your crops in here. But to those who did back then, Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and test me in this, and see if I don't throw open the windows of heaven and pour out blessing until it overflows. I dare you to test God with your giving. Don't make it something you're not going to notice because you won't see the hand of God. You won't see his provision. If it's nothing for you, if it's a giving up one latte a week, you're probably not going to be like, oh my gosh, God did a miracle. Right? God provided the five bucks, which, which he could, and I believe he would. But here's my challenge to you. As people who say that Jesus Christ is king, that he is our supplier, he's the one who provides, he's the one who protects, he is our security, would you test God in this one thing? My challenge is that you would start at 10%. Of whatever God gives to you. For some of you, that's a whole bunch of money. For others, it's not very much. And whether you give it to this church or you distribute it across the community, start giving it away. Start sowing it into the kingdom of God. Investing in people, caring for people. Start a new ministry. Begin to invest that into the kingdom of God and see if God doesn't bless you beyond what you can imagine. See if God doesn't take that and begin to build his kingdom such that you want to give even more. Jesus, in his inaugural sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, speaking to people about money and possessions and, and the fact that we all need to eat and drink and have clothes, he says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, to the believer... To the Christian, the person who calls them a disciple. If you're here today and you call yourself a Christian, you should be like, oh, this is to me. Jesus says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what kind of clothes you're going to wear. Matter of fact, unbelievers worry about those things. In Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things are going to be added to you. Would you trust him in that? Would you not be the Christian who just comes and hears? I go, oh, I heard the sermon, yeah, it was a good day. Like, Check my religion box for the week and we're done. But would you be the believer who, as Paul would say, that Jesus Christ is your life? That you're walking with Jesus when you're in this room and you're walking with him when you leave. You say, Jesus, I want to walk in obedience to everything you command. I want to be a disciple. I want to be someone who hears the word and then walks out of here and forgets it. I don't want to be the one who hears but doesn't do what the Scripture says, and so I delude and deceive myself. I want to be light in the midst of darkness. I want to follow after you. I want to give to others that you've given to me. And you start giving 
sacrificially. You start experiencing God supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. You begin to walk in the blessing that comes through giving. You begin to live a life of worship and trust before the Lord that is far beyond anything your income could afford you. Church, I know this is challenging. I know some of you might feel offended that I've asked you to begin giving. I want to be clear again. You don't have to give it here because I believe God is going to provide for us. But don't let your offense over a sermon on giving in a church keep you from living out obedience to the word of God. Man, begin giving sacrificially. And I believe God will take your five loaves and two fish and he'll begin to do the miraculous with it. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, you are our provider. God, you're much more secure than a bank account. You're much more secure than our retirement funds. You're much more secure than anything our wealth could afford us. God, we need to be reminded to depend upon you day after day after day. So, Father, I pray for the grace for every man and woman in this room today to be begin giving sacrificially. Lord, I don't know where the, the percentage is. But Lord, I pray that you would lead them. Lead us. And Lord, I pray that for everything that's given, that you would take it and you would bless it. That you would send it where it needs to go. And the harvest of souls would be reaped. Father, we're here for you. I pray that our giving would be acceptable, it would be pleasing, it would be a sacrifice. It's acceptable for you. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.